Hey, thank you for coming by for my Bible study. This is for Wednesday, uh, May the 8th. And um, I'm actually doing this the last day of March. I do them about a week or a week or a week and a day early. So they're ready to go because I'm busy all the time. And this is a Bible study from 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 6, through, uh, 6 verse 2. This is an important concept, really important. It's the ministry of reconciliation. And that's been given to the Christ follower, the ministry of reconciliation. So we're going to take a look at that today and study it, jump, jump around a little bit, look at some different scriptures, drive the word home into our hearts. And uh, let's pray before we do that. Father, speak to us today. I pray that you'd impact our lives with the power and, and the truth of your word, make a difference in our lives because we heard from you. I pray that you do that with power, with grace. Give me wisdom as I walk through these notes to make a difference in people's lives. Speak to us from your word, Father, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, uh, from 1974 to uh, 2005, I was in full-time ministry. And um, my least favorite thing probably was marriage counseling. It was a tough, that I have a hard time with that. I'll tell you why. By the time you get to marriage counseling, usually it's pretty well wrecked. And it's, it's not always, you, not, you can't always get people back together. Uh, they're far enough gone. Usually someone has a girlfriend or boyfriend or something like that. And it's it's really hard to put it back together. And they help, they help them with it. So when, when, when people get to the point where they need counseling, usually there's a wreck that's already happened, you know, and it's hard to work around that. But when a wrecked marriage is restored, when there's reconciliation, and that's happened a few times, it's a source of great, great joy. And it's similar to the message of reconciliation that we're gonna look at today, the great joy when people are reconciled, brought back into relationship with God, restored to a relationship with God. It's the biggest thing going. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as, as, long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. Somehow or another, I made a promise. 16, I wrote, read the wrong verse. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 16, okay? So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Okay, we don't see people from a worldly point of view. In Christ, we see people differently. We don't see them in human, just in human terms. So what's the point? Well, we don't see people in regard to just their human, their worldly status. It's different in Christ. And, and uh, he talks about that. The Apostle Paul in Galatians 3.28 talks about that. And I want to go jump, jump on that and read it real quick. Listen to what he said. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There's no, um, there's no um, Jew. There's no Greek. There's no racial distinction. In Christ, it's different. We don't see each other that way. There's no slave or free. There's no socioeconomic or social status in Christ. Not even male or female. Okay, we recognize there's a difference between males and females, but they have the same value, and we don't look at people just in terms of whether they're male or female. Why is that? He says, "For you are all one in Christ Jesus." We look at people differently in Christ. It's not about all the different things that humans have. It's about the fact that we don't see people as ethnic, social, even gender status. We see people as a new creation, a work of God. At one time, he says they even saw Jesus that way, based on his worldly status. Who was he? Well, he was a Jewish teacher. He was a Jewish guy, and he was a rabbi, a teacher. So, we don't we don't see them that way anymore. We see we see people differently than how we used to see them. We don't just see them on on their human status anymore. That's a big deal. Now look at verse seventeen. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. 
The old has gone. The new has come. Wow. That's kind of powerful right there. So we see people based on their spiritual condition, not their human condition. What's the spiritual condition in Christ? If you're in Christ, that's the position in life that you hold. If you're in Christ, you've been born again, and you, you have a relationship with Christ, you're in Christ. You could be, there are two positions in life. You can be in Christ or out of Christ. If you are in Christ, you're a new creation. The old is gone, and the new creation has come. And that's how we see people in Christ. They're a new creation, a brand new creation. How's that work? Well, he talks about that, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. We go back up above. We talked about that before. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for who died for them and was raised again. Christ's love drives spiritual perception, and it's different than just human percep perception. His love is this. One died for all. Jesus died for all of us. He took our place and died at our execution on the cross. He died paying for our sins, okay? Therefore, we all died as we surrendered to him. And Titus 3, 4 through 7 talks about that. And it's, that's a powerful passage, actually. Titus 3, 4 through 7. And uh, all I have to do is find it. Titus 3, 4 through 7. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, how did it appear? Jesus came. That's how the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared. He appeared here to sacrifice for us, give his life for us. Verse 5, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. He saved us by his mercy. How did he do that? He took our place at our execution and died for us, okay? And then he renews us. He makes us all new on the inside. He renews us by the washing of rebirth. I think that has to do with two things, okay? It does have to do with Christian baptism. It's a washing of rebirth. We die with Jesus or buried with Jesus and are raised to walk in a new life with Jesus. And also, you know what else he does? The washing of rebirth is he washes her sins away and starts changing you inside your life with the power of the Holy Spirit. I think it's both of those things, okay? So he had mercy on us. He took our place at our execution. And he saved us through the washing of rebirth. And he renews us, makes us new on the inside out, from the inside out by the Holy Spirit. We had a rebirth and we're renewed. And he poured the Holy Spirit out on us generously. And, the, and his grace and his forgiveness and his life transformation generously in our life. He changes us from the inside out. Verse 7, so that having been justified by his grace. Now listen to this, justified. That means we've been officially, legally declared not guilty because Jesus paid for our sin on the cross, okay? That we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. And hope means assurance. We become his heir because he paid for our sin, okay? So we, we have, the, he saved us, renewed us. We have the washing of rebirth. We have Holy Spirit renewal. He poured this out on us generously through Jesus Christ. We're justified, declared not guilty by his grace. Grace is a gift that we don't deserve. What gift was that? We didn't deserve Jesus to die in our place and to pay, take our sins. And you know what? We're heirs with the hope of eternal life. And that means the assurance of eternal life. That means when you... When you pass away, your life doesn't end. It just lands in heaven. I did a funeral today for an old boy. He's 85 years old. And I love this story. He, had, he, he got so sick he couldn't talk. So he wrote to his daughter on a whiteboard. This is what he said. He wrote on the whiteboard. This old boy wrote, I love Jesus on a whiteboard. Okay. So this is how I told him at the funeral. I said, you know what? Um, when he shows up in heaven, because he has the hope 
meaning the assurance of heaven. When he shows up in heaven, Jesus is going to have a whiteboard. And his whiteboard is going to say, I loved you first. Welcome home. See, we have the hope of eternal life. Jesus died for us. So we surrender to him. And you know what? We die to ourselves. I don't live for me anymore. I live for Jesus. That's what's supposed to happen. Then we live for him who died for us. Okay? So how do we see people? We see people differently than we used to. We see people as a new creation because the old creation died. When you come to Jesus and are reborn and cleansed and all the stuff we've talked about, and you become a new creation. The new creation has come when you come in Christ. When you choose to occupy the position of being in Christ as opposed to being out Christ. Because you're born again. Come into this phenomenal relationship with Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us this message of reconciliation. Wow. Okay, God reconciled us to himself. What? That means that he brought us back into relationship. He restored our relationship. To him. He did it. I didn't do it. He did it by what Jesus paid on the cross. So what is all this is from God? about it is the reality then that when we are in christ we're a new creation and god provided it for us we didn't do it god did it so how did god get this done he reconciled to us to himself through christ by christ dying for us on the cross and us coming to him and getting all our sins forgiven having his righteousness transferred into our life and we become a new creation since christ paid for our sin our sins are removed and without sin in, in the way, we're reconciled to God. The relationship we have with him is restored, just like a marriage being restored. It's the restoration of a relationship with God, and it's totally restored. Romans chapter 4, verse 5, listen to this. There's more than just the sins forgiven. We always need to remember this. Romans chapter 4, verse 5 says... However, to the man who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies, that means declared legally righteous, not guilty before the law, who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited to him as righteousness. When you come to Christ, yeah, your sins are forgiven, okay? But also your faith is credited to you as righteousness. The righteousness of Christ is credited to your account. Not only are our sins forgiven, but faith credits righteousness to us. See, when, when we are reconciled, our sins are removed. By the payment Jesus made for us on the cross, we come to him in faith. And the righteousness of Christ is credited to our account. Here's, here's how this works. I explain this to people all the time, especially in funeral services. One person in the universe has righteousness. Who is that? It's Jesus. Why? Because he lived 33 years, never sinned. He never sinned once in 33 years. You and I have a tough time with 33 minutes or 33 seconds. But Jesus never sinned once. So how much righteousness does he have? He has all of the righteousness in the universe. Nobody else has any. Jesus has it all. So when we come to Christ, our sins are forgiven based on what Jesus paid at the cross. And then you know what else he does? He, he it does an electronic funds transfer, okay? <laughs> And he does an electronic funds transfer and he transfers his righteousness into our account. And then when our body quits working, he checks the account and it says, totally filled with the righteousness of Christ. And guess what he does? He issues us a one-way ticket to his heaven. No questions asked. That deal is available to everybody. They all need to take it, don't they? Everybody needs to take that deal. Okay, those who are reconciled to God have been brought back into relationship with him. Their sins are forgiven. The righteousness of Christ is, is credited to their account. Those reconciled to God are ambassadors to the lost of the world, okay? 
they're ambassadors from the saved world to the lost world. And they go to the lost world saying, we want you to be reconciled to God and brought back into relationship with him. That is a desperate plea of our, of our, of our life to those who don't know Christ. We are, we are an ambassador to you and we want you to come to know Christ. We know it's available for you. So who has the message of reconciliation? The people who have the message of reconciliation are those who are reconciled through Christ. That's you and me, Christian. We have that. The, the, the 19th verse again of the fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians. I want to read it again. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the, re the message of reconciliation. Nobody's going to hear about it unless they hear about it from us. Why? Because Christ committed that message to us. It's up to us. We're the folks with the message. We're supposed to tell people. And we're ambassadors to do that. We're ambassadors of the kingdom of God to a lost and dying world. And our job is to get that message out to them. Look at the 20th verse. We're not done yet. Verse 20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Okay, big deal here. Be reconciled to God. We cry out to people. We sh everything we should do, everything churches should do, should have something to do with getting people to be restored to relationship with God. We should be acting as ambassadors all the time for God's kingdom crying out to the world's kingdom. That's, that's what I've always believed because the Bible teaches that, okay? Implore is a very, very passionate world word. Our, our call to the world is, be, is this, because Jesus reconciled us to God, we want you to be a part of that same reconciliation. We want you to be restored to God. That is, our, we are imploring you, be restored to God. It's there for you if you'll just take it. A lot of people poo-poo it and make fun of it. I have that all the time on my YouTube channel. People, you know, make fun of you. Go ahead. But I'm still imploring you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We, he's, he uses the word we in verse 19. Let me go back to that again. Um, verse 20, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. We, or the very first word in verse 20, this, it's a big word. It's exceptionally inclusive, okay? And it is Paul and his associates, and it's the people he addresses. It's inclusive of Paul, the folks with him, and the people that he's addressing it to. Even us today, okay, we are Christ's ambassadors. Hang on to that. That's what the text of the scripture teaches. We, you, me, we are Christ ambassadors. You don't have to be a pastor. You just need to be a Christ follower. If you're a Christ follower, you are an ambassador for Jesus Christ. By the call of God, you are an ambassador for Christ. The scripture teaches that. Second Corinthians 5 verse 21. And this gets, this is wild. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Wow. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. What are we talking about? How did Jesus become sin for us since he never sinned? Okay, how do you do that? Romans 8 verse 3. I'm going to go back to that real quick. Romans 8 verse 3. I'll get there. Romans 8, verse 3. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful men to be a sin offering, okay? And so he condemned sin in sinful man. How did he do that? It became a sin offering. How did he become sin for us? By being a sin offering. He was the lamb and he became a sin offering. That means that the Sin was put on the lamb, and the lamb was then offered to remove the sin. He took our sin on himself. He became sin for us for a time. 
He never sinned, but he took our sin and he paid for our sin. He was the lamb that paid for our sin. Jesus became the sin by being a sin offering for us. The lamb without defect was offered as a sin offering to pay for our sin forever, to pay for it all. Wipe it all clean. So he was that's how he became um, that's how he became sin for us by becoming the sin offering. In Hebrews 4, verse 15, back to the book of Hebrews, which is a great book. I keep saying I gotta take about a year sometime and work through the whole book of Hebrews. I've never done that. I probably should before I'm done, and I probably will. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery to the fear. Is that the, no, I've got them in the wrong chapters. He would, when you jump around a lot, you get a little confused sometimes. I'm old and stuff like that. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. I was looking, I was in chapter 3. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet was without sin. That's Jesus tempted in every way that we have been. Every temptation you ever had, Jesus had. He just never gave into it. That's why I say he lived 33 years without sin. The rest of us have a tough time going 33 seconds or minutes without sin, okay? He's sinless. He never sinned in 33 years, and he became sin for us by being the sin offering and taking our sin on his body. And then 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Again, I want to read that verse. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might have the right we so that in him what we might become the righteousness of God. Uh, in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus paid for our sin and the trust and and transfers his righteousness into our account. You know what's supposed to happen after he does that? The righteousness in our account, which is that's they call that imputed righteousness. It's given to us. And it stands for us, and it'll always be there but it also needs to be translated into our life. He accomplishes it for us when we trust him. And then it's supposed to show up. We're supposed to start living that way. And now you'll be working on that and God will be working on you for that for the rest of your life. It doesn't just pop up. It takes time. And look at 2 Corinthians 6, 1 and 2. The paragraph continues, you know, it just just because there's, a man inserted separation doesn't mean that the thought in the Greek text does not continue. It does. So it's uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 1 and 2. As God's fellow workers, we urge you to receive, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. He's saying, don't receive God's grace in vain. What does that mean? What does it mean to receive God's grace in, in vain? How do you receive God's grace in vain? Well, if you live like you have not received God's grace, you have received God's grace in vain. If it has no effect on you, that's receiving, that's living, that's receiving God's grace in vain. It should affect us. It should affect the way we live. We should be different because we've received God's grace. See, the Corinthians are God's fellow workers. And he wants to make sure that the way you live reflects God's grace in his favor and that it reflects his righteousness. So what does that mean? Live, this is the call of all of us, live like our sin is gone and live like Christ's righteousness is in you. It should show up in the way we live. Are we ever going to be perfect? No, you won't. But we ought to be getting more, more like Christ all the time. The sin should be gone. The righteousness should show up in our lives. So he says today is the day of salvation. Today is the time we should live God's favor in our life. We should, show, we should, we should live differently than we used to before. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the time to be ambassadors and let other people know about Christ. There may not be a, a tomorrow for them. Uh, this is the, I'm recording this on the last day in April, April 30th. I've done six funerals this month. People die all the time. 
and they, and who knows how many more days everybody has, right? We don't know. So I always want to, today is the day of salvation. I always want to be inviting others to come to know Christ. Don't leave it, don't leave to tomorrow what you can do today. Do we have a tomorrow? Do other people have a tomorrow? I don't know. You know, we don't know that we have tomorrow. They don't know that they have tomorrow. So live like you've been freed from your sin and like the righteousness of Christ has been given to you. Live differently than you did before with the power of Christ in your life and invite others to join you in that and make, make sure that we operate that way today and every day. I hope you do that. Thank you for sticking with me through this study. I hope it blesses your socks off. Let's pray. Father, thank you for speaking to us, for making a difference in our lives. I praise you for it. I do it in Jesus' name. Change us from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen.